Hi there, and welcome back to video number four, where we're going to start looking at not only niches, but how niches can interact with the um, different factors that create the environment in which they're living. So let's plow onwards and have a look at that. So because niches um, exist, we can, when we're looking at paleoecology and we're looking at collections of fossil species in a rock, so those would represent an ecosystem, we can assume that those collections will tell us something about the broad environment of deposition of that rock if those fossils are in situ. And that's because these um, individuals that are appearing in a single rock unit will be um, making, will be occupying a single ecological niche. And that works because, as we've already discussed, the spatial distribution of organisms and their associations are controlled by physical, chemical and biological processes. These are all of the things that define a niche. Those, um, those factors in the environment, the physical, the chemical and the biological factors in the environment, are often, but not always, best thought of as gradients. Now I've put a definition of a gradient on a slide. This is a gradual and continuous change in communities and environmental condition. Gradients can be related to environmental factors such as altitude, temperature and moisture supply. <clears throat> so these are things that we see um, having a gradual transition across an environment rather than an abrupt change. And that makes a lot of sense, right? If we think about an ocean near the surface, there's a lot more sunlight. So we would expect the temperature to be higher. We would expect there to be a lot more light. And as we get deeper within the ocean, we expect temperatures to go down unless there's something happening with currents and indeed the amount of sunlight that's reaching any given point to reduce. Similarly, as we go up a mountain, we might expect the wind to increase, the air pressure to decrease, the temperature to decrease. All of those are examples of environmental gradients. They're really everywhere. They can be not only determined by abiotic factors, these gradients such as the ones I've given you, but also by changes that you get in biotic interactions, such as competition along an environmental gradient. So essentially what I'm saying is biological and um, non-biological factors can influence um, each other. And so we'll see that in a bit more detail in a few slides time. Gradients are quite common. Although I should highlight that there are numerous environments where you also get abrupt changes in conditions. So just bear that in mind. So if we're thinking about this, a key question is how do these gradients affect organisms? So as we are aware by this point with all of our work on evolution, over time, populations evolve strategies to maximize their growth and reproduction, namely their fitness. And that occurs within a specific range of environmental factors. Outside an individual's environmental optimum or tolerance range, its physiology and its behavior may be negatively affected, reducing its overall fitness. And that's what this graph here shows. So you can see here fitness and abundance on the y-axis and any given environmental gradient, be that salinity, oxygen concentration, temperature, whatever you want on the x-axis. This line shows the fitness of an organism. And just to make life a bit easier, I've colored in some zones here where we can see that creatures are optimal within this zone towards the middle where they're thriving and they're reproducing. If life is pretty tough because they're outside their best conditions, they may be suboptimal. So they may be surviving, but not like really thriving. If they are way out of their, their um, best conditions, we but surviving, we could consider this marginal, so they're, in this case, they're not reproducing. So in other words, um, we may want to think about how this interacts with that idea of a realized niche. If all of these things are, 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 are living and are surviving, even our marginal ones are, are, you know, through dispersion, we have members of a species in this marginal zone, we can say that this must represent the realized niche for this organism. And that means that this shows us that within the realized niche, there is probably, in many, uh, in many circumstances, we may expect there to be a gradient with optimal conditions in the center of that realized niche. So it's adding some nuance to that idea of realized and perspective niches. Uh, I'm not sure how often we, uh, work as a community, as a 
uh, or how often ecologists consider these two interacting, but I thought it was interesting to think about those in those terms. So fitness varies across a gradient. When looking into this for this lecture, I wanted to highlight that I came across some concepts that I thought could be useful, especially to you, those of you that are doing our conservation um, specialty uh, in the environmental pathway. And it, this reflects the fact that um, organisms, species responses to gradients can vary widely. So we can put species into a number of loose categories and one which I thought would be particularly useful if you're interested in, say, conservation, would be the idea of bioindicators. So bioindicators are species or communities that are used to assess the quality of the environment and how it changes over time. And this works because if we look at our same graph again, they have a narrower range of tolerance than other species do. So we could, for example, view them as being closer to the end the specialist end of our spectrum than the generalist end of our spectrum. So bioindicators possess a moderate tolerance to environmental variability. That tolerance affords them sensitivity to indicate to us as scientists environmental change, but also the endurance to withstand some variability and thus reflect the general biotic response. We don't want things that just go extinct immediately in changing conditions because um, other than their extinction, they don't tell us that much. So this is very big in modern ecosystems for understanding the impact of anthropogenic activities on ecosystems and the, thing, the effect that things like climate change will have. In, with bioindicator species, we can use these to assess the health of an ecosystem. Um, the kind of the other end to that spectrum is the ubiquitous species shown here, where you can see this bell curve is far wider and flatter. So these are species which have very broad tolerances. They're less sensitive to environmental changes that otherwise disturb the rest of the community. So there's this gradation of responses to uh, changes in gradients within the animal and, and living kingdom. Living kingdoms, I suppose. So I thought that was interesting in a, from a conservation standpoint. And I wanted to finish with a few slides highlighting potential ways with which um, Niches can react to gradients. That was poor English, but I hope you get what I'm saying. How um, gradients and niches interact is basically what I'm getting at here. Because I thought this was key, right? This is a really interesting idea. You've got this idea of niches, you've got this idea of gradients. How do those two interact? And what I found out is that, that actually a lot of the research that I um, came across when I was preparing for this lecture was actually quite old. This doesn't seem to be a particularly hot topic of research right now. And I should highlight then that, you know, um, there is definitely, I think, scope to do further studies in this area. So take this for what it's worth. This is based on um, essentially some um, research that was first um, conducted in the 1970s. And indeed, I think it's fair to say, based on my trawl of the literature, that the exact relationships of organisms to gradients are argued about and they fall into several schools. This has largely played out, this argument, in plant ecology. And there is study in this area to try and differentiate between these end members. I found it very difficult when I'm looking through the literature to find examples of this kind of study within the animal kingdom. So early in the history of paleoecology and the study of paleo communities, it was thought that communities were very tightly coupled to environments. And this is a situation that we see here. On our y-axis, we have the density of individuals of any given species. And on our x-axis, we have an environmental gradient. And in this instance, we see zonation of species. We have well-defined communities. This is a community here of one, two, three, four species. And as we go along this gradient here, that community dies out and another one comes into place. And we see another four species being more successful in this part of our environmental gradient. The implication here is that recurring and widespread groupings that we see in the fossil record, for example, are primarily dictated by environmental gradients rather than biological interactions. This gradient is doing all the control here. And as well as these well-defined communities, we have boundaries between them that are sharpened by competitive exclusion. So these kind of sharp upward um, lines show that we've got competitive exclusion within these regions.
This view reflects only one end member, however, of a range of views in ecology, and there is ongoing debate. For example, other researchers believe that there is less strong coupling between the environment and the community. In this example, we still have competitive exclusion, we still have these sharp edges towards the um, edge of any particular species tolerance, but we don't have a tight linkage between um, the gradient and the organisms that are living in any given range. So there's no tight linkage there, meaning that actually, whilst we get different species along our gradients, they don't really form sharp community boundaries. So our communities in this case would be less apparent. Here is an example where we have far less impact from competitive exclusion. We don't see those sharp boundaries at the edges of our range along a gradient. But coupled with environmental gradients and driven by biological interactions, we could expect this situation to create loose communities that you can see here. So we still have the interaction of these different communities as we go along our gradient. That's not necessarily the case though. We may expect to see less impacts of environmental or biotic interactions and then even less strong delineation of communities. So one key thing that we're seeing as we've gone through these graphs is we're seeing kind of a decreasing influence of biotic interactions um, as we're mapping our niches to our gradients. Um, and where, these, where um, the reality is between these different end members from this all the way down to this is a matter of current research. Empirical data from plant communities where much of this research has been done suggests that this figure here might be our most accurate. But that applies to the plants, of course, and we may expect something different to occur in a different group of organisms. And indeed, um, we may expect very different patterns to appear in different, um, along different environmental gradients. So indeed, there's probably a range of things out there. So in reality, what we're probably looking at is a mix between these end members that I've shown you, depending on the ecosystems and the gradients that we're talking about. In my opinion, this is a really interesting topic that could do with a lot more research. So take that for what it's worth. I'm flagging some stuff that we don't know. If we return quickly to look at our gradients, I wanted to highlight that we can identify three primary kinds of gradient. The first is a resource gradient. These are gradients that reflect an environmental variable that is actually consumed by an organism, such as water or nutrients, such as this delicious feast that I took from Spirited Away um, that the, uh, the monster No Face is eating here. So that is an example of a resource gradient. Kind of one step removed from that, one step above that, we have things that are called direct gradients. These reflect environmental va variables that are not consumed by the organism, but they, that directly affect the physiology and growth of that organism. Examples of this may be temperature and moisture, especially in ter terrestrial organisms, right? So this is represented by, for example, the temperature gradient as we go towards the furnace here. So thing, organisms may be far more comfortable at higher temperatures than they are at lower temperatures. I do not know where dust bunnies, as appeared in Studio Ghibli, stand on that particular point. So there you go, take that for what it's worth. Finally, we have a thing that we could call the indirect gradients. These are things, gradients, that do not directly affect the physiology of organisms, but are tied to factors that do affect the physiology of organisms. So <clears throat> as a fantastic example of that, elevation acts as an indirect gradient. As we go higher, so as we climb up a mountain here, or up this building here, we would expect the elevation to change the temperature, the oxygen le levels, and the moisture of that environment. Because all of those show a strong variation with elevation. So that's, those things are our direct gradient that's directly affecting our, our organism, but the altitude is the indirect gradient that's actually controlling all of those. It's the common cause for that change. And combined, those types of gradients define where organisms can live. So let's have a quick example of that in the real world. So let's try and understand what this means for a particular ecosystem. And because I'm on original, let's use a marine ecosystem because we've, 
got a lot more information, certainly from the rock record, about marine ecosystems. So in marine ecosystems, we can once more, if we want to split these up into physical, chemical and biological factors, we may want to consider when we're thinking about our gradients. The physical factors will be the temperature, substrate consistency, turbidity, sunlight, current, frequency of disturbance and water depth. Those are all physical factors. There will be chemical factors at play as well. These will include salinity, so um, fish such as those shown on this slide, which is actually a fantastic, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, I've forgotten the word for it. Image made up of tiles. It will come back to me uh, from Pompeii. So this is actually uh, from Pompeii, which is pretty cool. Um, anyway, yeah, fish typically like uh, water of a set salinity. Um, but other chemical factors will include oxygen concentration, concentration and a nutri nutrition concentration availability. And there are biotic factors at play in marine ecosystems that include competition, predation and herbivory. So many of those factors are of course interrelated, such as sunlight and depth. Water depth is the most important factor in marine communities at a large scale, and this is an indirect gradient. That controls our light, our nutrients, and our temperature. So all of those will then directly impact the physiology or the ability to survive of our organisms. After that, substrate consistency appears to be the next most important factor in open marine settings. So that we see variations between soupy muddy substrates and firm shelly to sandy substrates in terms of the things that are living there. In intertidal settings, uh, salinity is also very important uh, as a control on the biota. So when you have changes in salinity, that will strongly control the organisms that you say in there. Um, after that, your next biggest controls are typically um, salinity, oxygen and nutrient con concentrations as well as bio biotic controls. So all of those have an impact, but our most important one in marine ecosystems is uh, water depth. So that's an example of the important gradients that we see in one real world ecosystem. I'm now going to pause this recording and look up that word that I was looking for for these things from Pompeii because it's really annoying me. I have unpaused and the word was mosaic. Mosaic was the word I was looking for. My God, that shouldn't have been so hard. Obviously I'm getting old. Okay, so that is the end of video four. I'll see you in video five, where we're going to take a dip into the fossil record to look at an example of, of how all of this interacts when we're actually looking at the fossils that we find in rocks. So I'll see you in a second.